and, and there, there's really no evidence of. I'll just leave it at that. Um, the, uh, there was a news article that I that I, I missed. I saw it, but I didn't really get the whole interview uh, of the day of, I think the day of the shooting of the rapper Young Dolph. And, uh, and I heard, I got a chance to hear the lady's entire interview with, I, I think it was Fox 13 News. And she was saying like, she was saying, she was saying things like this, right? I don't know, I don't know who the lady is. I'm sure she's pretty nice. It was probably traumatized and expressed how fed up she was with what all that was going on and as well as the, the high crime rate or the shootings that's been going on. But she said some things that, you know, that deserve some pushback in my opinion. Hence, Rico and his opinions. She said, oh, well, I'm tired of living here. I want to leave Memphis. No, I don't like it here no more. And I live just a few blocks from here. And, uh, <laughs> okay. She said, I want to leave Memphis because I don't like it here. And, I, and this goes on. She said, I've gone through this, meaning the shootings in her neighborhood and I guess the Ketchum and Castelia area. I've I've gone through this quite a bit. So I just want to say to that lady about that point, uh, you don't have to leave Memphis if you're tired of what's going on in your neighborhood. What you can do is, I think, you you, you leave your neighborhood and, and move to a neighborhood where that activity doesn't go on. All right? Don't, don't do Memphis like that. Uh, you know, go move because you don't have to live on Ketchum and Castelia. If you believe, if you can say, I'm, I want to move, I'm going to move that quickly, I'm assuming that you have the means to go ahead and leave. So, but you don't have to leave the city, you leave that neighborhood. You, you got Bartlett, you have Collierville, you have Germantown, uh, Houston Levy area, you have uh, Arlington, you have Oakland. You have, uh, I think, parts of downtown. You have, you even have, um, <laughs> in Mississippi, Olive Branch, Hernando. You even have Holly Springs. So, because you're tired of what's going on in that neighborhood, it doesn't mean that you want to leave the entire city. So, I didn't get that. Uh, and then she began to get a little political, which it, I, I understand it was... It was she was given an emotional rant based on what what was considered a traumatic experience for her the shooting that happened over in that area right but she said she's been used to hearing shooting so I don't know why this well, I guess because it, it, it was a celebrity yeah because we seem to act differently when it's a celebrity but black men have been being shot leading up to this celebrity being shot and I don't know why we didn't we don't have this kind of hurt and trauma over black boys, young black men killing each other, and all of a sudden now a celebrity black male, a famous black male, or rich black male gets murdered. Now it's time to, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's y'all. I know I'm not the only one, but I I just have to talk about what I see. What's up, Ian? I just got your your your, your instant message. What's up, brother? And uh, and so all of a sudden. It, the world has come to an end because a black celebrity, or uh, she say a mega star. She referred to him as a mega star, but yeah, he's still normal. And now he's a mega star. Is he a normal person? Because celebrities aren't normal people. I don't know why y'all don't understand that. Celebrities and mega stars aren't normal people. They're mega stars. And they're they're rich. So, but I guess because you saw him in the neighborhood every once in a while, you thought of him as being a regular person. I get it. She said, well, you know, and this is the part that really caused my antennas to go up. This lady who was on the news, I think it was Fox 13 News, she called a reporter's name. I don't know the black guy's name, but he kind of let her talk, and she tried to egg him into her situation by saying, you know, you interview killings all the time, don't you? Don't you? You're like, mm-hmm. And so, don't you think that was wrong? He's like, so, he re redirected her back to talking about the issues at hand. But she went on to say, this lady in Memphis who was interviewed, she said, uh, 
Well, you know, they passed those open carry laws, those gun laws. Them, no, I don't know if she said those Republicans, but she said in the state of Tennessee. So, listen, Jeremy Pierre. Thank you, Mary Max. Welcome, girl. Mary Max, I'm telling you, y'all missing out. This girl is on it. Let me just applaud. It. Thank you, Mary Max. Jeremy Pierre from Fox 13 News. I'm assuming that was Fox 13. And so, she was saying that they passed... Open and carry laws so black people could shoot each other. That's what she said. And just say it without stuttering. Stuttering. And Brinka, hey girl, what's up? She said that with a clear mind. That lady said that. I'm like, what are you talking about, ma'am? They passed open and carry. What's up, Leon Fry? Uh, <laughs> ma'am, they didn't pa pass open and carry. So African Americans in the hood could shoot each other? No, this is what she said. It was also really weird. She said, so these young kids can walk around here with guns and not get arrested or something like that. Like, wait a minute. When I read the law and when I got a better understanding of the open carry law, oh, I'm sorry, not, not just open and carry, but permit permitless law. Meaning you'll need a permit, but the people didn't read the rest of the law. It says that, you know, you can buy a gun, you have to be of age, what, over 18 or something like that, and have a clean record. They're going to run your record and check your record. They're not just giving 15 and 14 year olds gun, ma'am, guns, ma'am. They're not giving 18 year old guns. You're talking about criminals who already have guns. You know, they do the the gun buyback program, Mary Max said, this is the result of not reading. And yeah, being fed information. So I'm trying, I'm trying to break this down slowly. She said, <laughs> God, dog. <sighs> she said that because now these kids, these young people can just walk around with guns and they won't get arrested. Ma'am, that's untrue. Ma'am, please forgive me. That's untrue. If they're caught with the guns, they'll be arrested. And see, when they do the, the gun buyback programs, the criminals are not trading in guns. That's why I always thought that was the dumbest thing that any city could do. And anybody, any politician or preacher or, whatever, or, or whoever is in leadership uses this or that as a, a, a somewhat of a solution to gun violence, he's playing with y'all. That's the easiest crap on the planet to do. It's stupid. Doesn't make sense. Why would they do that? And people actually actually think it was making some doing some good. It's not. The criminals do not turn in their guns. And number two, law abiding uh gun owners, they're not the ones of shooting up shooting up the black neighborhoods. It's the criminals. They're not the ones doing drive bys. It's the criminals. So I don't understand how this lady and everyone else want to make this a Republican thing. I think with that hood mentality, we have something against law, rules and laws. It's almost as if we're not supposed to follow them and any law that's passed is against black people specifically. The only thing that was passed was that in, in history, that no, I'm just going to say in short history, was the 94 crime bill that Joe Biden put together in the late 80s. And Bill Clinton, and he re reintroduced it for Bill Clinton's presidency, presidency, and Bill Clinton signed it. Joe Biden. <laughs> you know, you don't know if you are black. If you don't vote for me, but you, you ain't black. No, Dementia Joe, Jerry, uh, Geriatric Joe, Jim Crow Joe. But blacks don't seem to have a problem with it, even the folks in the hood. You know, and it, it, her, watching her video is kind of disturbing how she just, I guess the reporter just let her just rattle off a bunch of stuff that didn't make sense. And she's completely wrong about the gun laws. Completely wrong. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. So I don't know why that's an issue with anybody. Because you're a law-abiding, trained gun owner. You don't get in trouble. Let me tell you how easy that is. You know those kids whose parents, mother and father, put them in boxing or put them in karate or jiu-jitsu? 
if you go look at the numbers, those kids, those young men, get in the least skirmishes and fights at school. Because training brings discipline. Training brings respect for the art. When people go and buy guns, no, legitimately, they go to the gun range or they go out hunting with licenses. There's a training and a respect that comes with guns and in society when you've been trained in some form of art, boxing or karate. So why don't we understand is why we try to mince issues. Now, I don't mind her being hurt about the passing of the celebrity. Travis, what's up, man? But we got to, you know, I, I, and I've watched it for, for so long, you know, how we automatically, because people die, we make them, uh, because they automatically die, we, make, we put angel wings on them. And we know in real life, unless you don't know, when they were here, there are some people who are not doing great things, nice things. So we're gonna have to learn how we're gonna have to get we're gonna have to learn how to properly grieve and what to really grieve. If you wanna know, I'll tell you I've been in mental health and social work for the past 24 years. And I think the hood aspect of black people, they we haven't been taught because they've been living through and working through and dating through and working through trauma. We don't seem to understand it. The black, the hood section of black America. Because it's not all of us. It's just this promoted s small piece. Well, it's not even a small piece because it's been funded. This hood nigga mentality in the black race. And then you have politicians and everybody trying to jump on this. Doing easy things for solutions. Let me tell you another video I saw today. That, that bothered me. There was this little boy. There was a little boy on the news. I saw this clip. It was sent to me. Shout out to Mary Max. This little boy was crying his ears out. I mean, I mean his eyes out. Say, man, you my favorite rapper, man. You my favorite rapper. Oh, and I felt his hurt. I felt hurt for him because he really believed he lost a loved one. And guess what? I shed tears when Michael Jackson passed away. Because that's what he, that's how much he meant to me. But, I'm sorry, y'all. I've been a mental health guy for the past, over 20 years. And I make observations. And I observe behavior. And I look at mental health. Make assessments. And I said, something not right about that. And then I go back to the 80s. Like 83, 84, 80, 84 85, 86. When the crack era hit and started taking out fathers and taking the men out. And so around 94, when the Joe Biden, when Joe Biden's political career put together, when Joe Biden put together the crime bill for Bill Clinton to sign, that nailed the coffin. That put the nail in the coffin on a lot of black men. Thousands of black men went to jail for selling crack. And, you know, selling crack and the, 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 the murders that ensued and all kinds of stuff that came along. I was there. I was there. I saw it. Uh, one summer I was doing Captain May I and, and all of this and uh, playing, playing football in the street. Then the next summer all kinds of cars was coming up and down our street. Women that I knew as a little boy, all of a sudden they, they started looking strange. And then people who I didn't know started coming on our street. And people I went to junior high school with all of a sudden became, they were drug dealers or users of crack. So I saw it firsthand. And so that began the process or continued the process of black boys, black children being raised without fathers, along with women choosing to have babies without a father. That, along with the crack, you have this generation of black boys for the last 45 years with no masculinity, no father figure in their lives. Let me go back. I didn't have a father growing up either. 
But let me tell you something. I was very fortunate to have been a teenager in the 80s. In the 70s and the 80s. Because I went to my beloved Cypress Junior High School. And there were men in the school. Real men with families. Masculinity. What I didn't get at home, I was able to get it on my street. There were men on my street who had wives and children, masculine men. So I was pretty much covered. Even when I went, I got my little first little job selling candy. Archie Muhammad, shout out to that brother, who had a wife and about seven kids. He went to that mosque that Mash did on 3rd Street. He would come and get me and my brother and take us all over Memphis selling candy. So, and, 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 and there were other men on the truck, masculine men. Are y'all following me? See, when y'all ladies decide to have your child without a husband, you subject him with the possible disappearance of masculine figures. And a lot of you don't want no man because you want to run everything. Shout out to feminism. And you raise these little weird ass, little emotional, uh, effeminate, unsure, boy, angry, Violent boys or cowardly weak boys or traumatized boys. That's what has happened. And so let's go back to that little boy. He was just crying and crying. I said, you know what? When they took the fathers out, society made sure that they had a replacement for daddies. Not just Uncle Sam, but also celebrities. They took actual men out. They, they convinced the women to remove the men. And only have sex with men who are lower than a principal, lower than a professor, lower than an engineer, lower than a teacher. These women getting pregnant by other women's husbands, dope boys, uh, gang members, hustlers. None of these men qualified to be fathers. And these are the, these are the men, even right today, that African American women majority on a majority reproduce children with and then they expect these men to be fathers to a child i'm telling you what the scholars and i'm telling you what i witness and it's still going on today so that little boy was crying i said I wonder what his father was the one and there was a man consoling him i don't know if that man was his father or not the man said yeah now here we go with this hood mentality yeah, man, we lost a real nigga. That's what the man telling this little eight-year-old little boy was crying his eyes out hurt. Yeah, we lost a real, they took a real nigga. Like, really, bro? I mean, this man had gray beard and all that. That's, that's what you can say to a young black boy? We lost a real nigga? Isn't it because of us believing that we're niggas and using that racist, horrible word, nigga? That's why we're so below at the bottom of everything? Because that nigga is a powerful word that we just use, we describe ourselves, and we try to debate it. Like, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with nigga? Well, actually, Jews, what's wrong with the racial slur that white folks put on them? Ask Hispanics, what's wrong with the racial slur that whites put on them? Ask Latinos, what's wrong with the racial slur that whites put on them? Ask homosexuals, what's wrong with faggot? And we're the only ones with this Stockholm Syndrome when it comes to white folks. We just fell in love with the oppressor. We're falling in love with the capturer. I'm not saying we're not supposed to behave civil, civilly with other people. But we, got to, we, got, we need some serious therapy. Because my hometown is, is in need of therapy. But I, but, but I want people to stop saying this crap. Pray for Memphis. Because I've been seeing that hashtag. Pray for me. Memphis doesn't need any prayer. It needs fathers. It needs masculinity. It needs manhood. That's all it needs. It doesn't need no goddamn prayers. That's all we do. When we, when we don't know what to do, or we know what to do, but we don't want to do it, let's all pray about it. You know, Lord, don't make a way. When the hell has the Lord made a way? I know the slaves wish the Lord had made a way. 300 years of beatings, lynching, rape, sodomy, selling our families. You know the law is going to make a way. Y'all cut it out, black Memphis, black Chicago, black Detroit, black St. Louis, black Houston, black Dallas. Cut it out. 
You're supposed to make a way. It was written in books that you say you believe in. The Bible has all the instructions that Jesus supposedly left. So why are we in all this, all this turmoil? Why don't we know how to grieve? I'll tell you why. Just keep listening. Because we don't believe in therapy. A lot of our women don't believe in family. They'd rather be a baby mama than a wife than a mother. I'm talking from statistics. And what I see every day, even as we speak, the med is delivering some bastard black baby from a teenage single mama or a 20-something-year-old mama or a 30-year-old helper. Yeah, I said it. Because the people that you like won't say it. And that's the problem with Memphis, is lower thinking. You know, making heroes out of people who are not heroes. That's what is happening. and that's But that's that hood thing. You know, we talk about, we, we, it's, it's, it's the weirdest thing for me to witness. You know, I don't, I don't understand that. But yes, I do. If I didn't understand, I wouldn't talk about it. I'm just telling you. You know, now we got people that want to have meetings about, let's have a meeting. Your, your favorite politicians want to have meetings in Memphis. I guess the goddamn prayer, I mean, um, I guess the prayer breakfast is next, huh? Black eyed peas, cornbread, with the white mayor and white liberal Democrats. Let's all pray for the city. I can tell y'all the solution. I just gave y'all some, drop some nuggets. And this can go across the black city. I mean, not just black Memphis, but all of the black sections of all of the urban cities in this country. Isn't it interesting? You know, whether it's police, whether it's education, but isn't it interesting how Bartlett, Germantown, Collierville, Arlington, or Hernando, Olive Branch, they don't seem to have these issues? Yeah, yeah, I ain't never. No one's ever thought about that. And a lot of black people live in these in, in these areas. Isn't it interesting when black people move out of the hood in Memphis and any other black urban areas? They all of a sudden know how to behave when they go to Germantown. They know how to behave when they go to Bartlett. They know how to behave when they go to the deeper part of Cordova. They know how to behave when they get to the, I guess, the upper middle class, which is considered the upper middle class part where white folks live. See, these are the things we need to be having conversations about. We don't need no goddamn pray for Memphis. It's too easy. Y'all stop letting these Negro politicians off the hook so easily. Make them take their ass to work and get some money. Because you know what? Those same politicians that act like, well, let's go out and have a march and, and pray for these black men. Uh-uh. Because you know what they didn't do when they got the money for the FedEx Forum in any stadium in any in in urban city across this country? They didn't pray for it. They lobbied and they voted on it. They voted on $500 million to build a damn FedEx Forum. How come, they became, how come those same Negro politicians in Memphis and anywhere else, black Dallas and all across, how come they can't get together and vote on a $350 million package for the revitalization of North Memphis, South Memphis, White Haven, Ketchum and, Ka and Ketchum and Crump and, and Castalia area. Y'all see what I'm talking about? Politicians still playing games with black folks. Y'all love Jesus and you love Democrats. So you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Violence is not a requirement because you black. Who, who thinks that? The hood doesn't have to be ugly because you because uh, uh, um, because uh, you live there. Does it, who does that? Even in Midtown Memphis, yeah, it's not that much tripping going on. I said there's something going on. It's it's a mindset. We're gonna have to get past this. No, first we have to address it. And we're going to have to stop these behaviors that only hurt us. I don't want to hear nothing about no goddamn Republicans. I don't want to hear nothing about no goddamn racism. I don't want to hear anything about no goddamn white supremacy. Because white supremacy and racism are just like oxygen. 
God damn it, you still breathing. So you can still make it through racism like we've done. But there's some things even under racism. Let me take y'all back 100 years, 140 years. When black folks were released from the plantation. Under racism. Hard in your face, white supremacy. Can't sit here, boy. What you doing around here, gal? Nigga, you no. Know, but they still, they understood the assignment. Said, no, I don't have a missile. No, I don't have a tank. No, I don't have an AK. You know, but I got my shotgun. I got my family. I got an axe. I got a hammer. I got some nails. I got some wood. Well, I got trees around me. And I, I got a saw to, to cut stuff down and build my own. See, racism is not going anywhere. And y'all need to stop letting these black activists who show up on CNN and MSNBC talking about the racist white man make a fool out of you. Stop it, black Memphis. Black gays and black Greeks. I keep telling y'all. Y'all keep voting these black gays and these black geeks, black fraternity sorority people, or black Greeks. Y'all keep voting them in. They're not there for the betterment of black people. They're there for the betterment of themselves as individual. Uh, I'm the city council. Uh, 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 I'm the county commission. Oh, I'm, I'm the CEO of this. I, I'm the board. I'm head of this board. All they live for, just look at their history, that they just live for positions. And they don't give a damn about you unless you are Greek just like them. No, I'm not hating. I'll debate any Negro Greek. Bring it on. Cause I, I, my information comes strictly from or around the way. But shout out to Steve Coakley who broke this down years ago. We won't read what the scholars wrote. We will not read what the scholars wrote. They gave us, they left us works that we can use to help us get through the rest of our lives. But we won't. Because we fell for these diversionary tactics called diversity. Multiculturalism. While black people fooling around with those two dumbass concepts, homosexuals, Immigrants and others have run circles around black folks. And we still around here looking stupid. About, well, you know, everybody's inclusive. What about intersectionality? All this dumb crap that so-called college-educated educate, blacks have been perpetuating on our, on our community, particularly the hood. See, I'm still a hood brother at heart because I understand it is the hood is where our people are. And those of us who are supposed to have good sense, you know, those who hold all the positions, your, your judges, your lawyers, your accountants, you work in the police department, you work in the sheriff departments, your professors, I mean, your social work, your everything, but you have yet to put together a, a plan or an, and an economic package to address the inner city. That's, that's always on my mind. Oh my God, it had another shooting. Oh, just hush. Hush. It can be stopped. But I think it's just like, you ever known those people that have what's called a victimhood mentality? Victimhood mentality? That That's a real thing. I think we just like to, a lot of, lot of us like to have that going on so we can complain about it. You know, they don't have enough for poor folks. You know, they, because I'm black. Of course, because you're black. You've been in this country over two, what, 200 years, up to about three, for about 200 years. You ain't figured out yet. You still say. And by the way, on a side note, uh, anyway, I'm not even going to inject that into this. I'm about to mention people tripping about the cow ridden house, but, you know, I'm so over that shit. Uh, let's concentrate on the Maude Aubrey case, y'all. That's, that's the case we need to be really concentrating on. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I want to I want to issue out a challenge to those who uh, who are really in mourning, who are really hurt by the murder uh, of young Dolph. I want to I want to issue a challenge to you because I heard you. I read all I read all your comments. I watched the videos. You said young Dolph brought property. He's giving back to the hood. He bought he bought property. He uh he was he gave out turkeys. He was uh he helped pay 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 for somebody's school. I mean he he did a whole he did quite a few things. Uh you know, they were considered good. 
right? So I want to give you an assignment as you remember his good works. Since you don't want to pay attention to the music and the image that he put out. So let's, pay, let's look at his good works. I want to challenge y'all to honor young Dolph by being opposite of what his music talked about in imagery on his CDs and his videos and his lyrics. Be opposite of that. Um, I want to challenge you to continue his good works, his legacy of buying up the block, uh, taking care of one another in the hood. Uh, go even further by going to school, educating yourself, uh, going to therapy to address the trauma. Because the ghetto is made up of a lot of trauma. I'm going to say it again. The ghetto is made up of a lot of trauma. Not just from police, but from these households. These drunk-ass daddies, these mad-ass mamas, these angry-ass aunties, these brutal-ass grandmas. Yeah, trauma. And then poor poverty. But see, poverty is a state of mind. And I'll say it again. My mother's always said to me, Rico, I don't care if you're born. And said to me and my brother and my sisters, I don't care if y'all are born, if you're born in a barn. You don't have to look nor act like an animal. So to behave savagely because you live in the jungle, that's that's no excuse. And then all this crap, but that's all they know. Well, why in 2021 is all somebody knows? All you got to do is just drive one mile up the street and you'll see something different. See, the hood is just your address. It's not your DNA. It's not. It's not on your birth. I mean, it, 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 it didn't come out. When you came out of your mom's vagina, hood wasn't stamped on your body. But somehow, it's been stamped in too many people's brains. And they believe that that is a legitimate way or an appropriate way to behave in society. And that's not cool. It doesn't have to be that way. So I want to challenge you to continue Young Dolph's legacy. Those of you who are crying and saying he was great and calling him a legend. Well, continue his works. Go to school. Clean your life up. Get off the drugs. Uh, what else? Start giving back to the community. When you get your money, invest in yourself. Invest in bringing up the hood. You know, do, continue his legacy. So, by the time you start continuing Young Dolph's legacy, the hood will no longer be the hood. It'll be a neighborhood. Because I didn't grow up in the hood. I grew up in a community. I grew up in a neighborhood. It didn't become the hood until the 90s. Did y'all understand? And I, I was hearing some people saying that music doesn't influence. And then there's a saying that says, music soothes the savage breasts. Music does control one's behaviors. But I call it the soundtrack of trauma. A lot of music these black rappers put out. It's the soundtrack of trauma. And then you got white Jews and white homosexuals who give them money to you know to monetize their trauma in such a negative way. And then they don't allow them to be an artist that uplifts the black race or the hood. Because all this music, all these rappers that we have, none of their music has ever moved the hood. Not even an inch into the present or into progress, ever. Never. It's never done that. You know, isn't it interesting how the record labels, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of young men who rather, who would rather, who have the intelligence or the intellectual fortitude to rap like Will Smith. Let me tell y'all something. Did I share with y'all about Will Smith? 
No, he's all over the place sharing his book and talking about his childhood with that uh, wife of his and you know, sharing. Will Smith and people like Lupe Fiasco and you know, these rappers that don't cuss out black folks, they don't really get a lot of air spins and they don't really get played on the radio. And, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of black boys, if they thought they could, they'd rather rap like Will Smith. The way he rapped in the 80s. In the early 90s. You know, nobody was hurt. Nobody got tattoos. And nobody started smoking blunts. And, you know, and I know that a lot of that is uh, behavior driven. Because we're looking for relief from the depression, the anger, and the trauma. So weed, alcohol, heroin. Then also... What Madison Avenue spends billions of dollars advertising. It is called an image. And messages. So that's what they're ready to put out. Because there is. Hey Nancy. There is an agenda. Afoot all the time. See. And I'm taking it all around. Back to what Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu talked about. What Dr. Naeem Akbar talked about. What. Dr. Francis Chris Wilson talked about, and all these, these three folks plus others, Dr. Amos Wilson talked about. That is the protection and, and the upliftment of black boys. You can't have a community without healthy, strong, masculine, intelligent boys. Thugs, pansaggers, tattoos with lips on their neck all around here, and drugs in their minds is leading them. That doesn't leave, leave, lead a community anywhere. It doesn't even, it doesn't even serve uh, as protection. <laughs> but that is what, that's what's allowed in rap music and now in R&B. That's the rap that they want. That's the, that's the rap music that they promote. They put millions of dollars behind it. And see, there in Memphis, Tennessee, if you really want to stop something, com I want you to continue what I started 15, 16 years ago, when I did an individual protest of Hot 107 and K97, but mainly Hot 107. See, there's a, there are a lot of mechanisms in place that if black folks in Memphis really cared about black children, you would be attacking all those systems that are attacking your children. But then you have the geniuses that say, well, they ain't the music. Well, I tell you what, if White folks in Germantown, Hernando, Olive Branch, Arlington, Bartlett, Eads. If they thought that their white children or mixed children were being heavily influenced by what's played on High 107, they would get together and they'd they organize, get their money together and bring George Flynn, Shea Flynn and the Flynn family to court. Or at least in the court of public opinion, if not legal court, to have Hot 107 shot, shut down. To have K97 shut down. But see, it has to get to a point where grown people there care about black children. Mainly black boys. We don't care about black boys, look at the community. It's in shambles. You got black children, since they don't have any male role models, the NBA players, the football players, and the black rappers that the white Jews and white homosexuals fund, they're the new, they're the surrogate fathers. Y'all understand? I know you do, because I'm talking to intelligent people. Now, I wish they would get to the folks out there who are not here, but, you know, it's fine. Y'all make sure y'all share this. You know, you have to. You have to plant seed. You have to water the seed called black boys. We've had male and female scholars talk about it. Go look at the statistics, how boys are faring in education, out in life, in the job market. Out this period, look how they're faring. We seem to don't care. But if the neighborhood was losing 30 black girls a weekend, we, we, we would have written the president. We would have had meetings with the governor. We've uh, tried to find some kind of outside sources. To make sure this has to stop. This is an epidemic. Oh my God. They're killing these little black girls. These black girls are being gunned down. They're killing each other. Y'all don't think I see that? Y'all don't think other people see that? We see the difference that you make. 
We see your bias and your misandry against boys. Your anti-male misandry, anti-black male misandry. You don't think we see that? We see it. But a lot of young men don't know how to articulate what's happening right in their face. Let's go back to you church folks. Follow me. Let you know how important black boys are. And when you mothers decide to make a choice to have black children out of father, I want y'all to really come up here to the to the to your uh, your your cell phone or your laptop or your or your tower you no know, your desktop. Come close. See when you make that choice to have a child without a father, you're setting that child up for for more likely destruction, for failure. Because you didn't care enough to make sure the child had a father. And I'm going to keep saying that. Get offended, goddammit. So much so that you're like, you know what? I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this number. And I'm going to take action. Let's go back to, to how white people do stuff. And I know they always say, well, why are you bringing in white folks? Well, I, I talk about white folks with the positive stuff they do. And how they protect their children. Even some of your wonderful your Democrat and liberal white folks that y'all love in Memphis a lot. Then y'all just swear the Republican ones are just so terrible. And yeah, they're terrible, but they're protective of their families because they believe in mother and father being at home. But black and white Democrats don't care about no daddy being at home. Because when the daddy's not there, they can just come on in the house and run the women. That's how it's always been. That, that's the plan from the beginning. And women have volunteered to play in their, in their plan. Now look at it. We don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Teach these young girls in high school about at least 10 of the 30 forms of birth control. Teach them just because they have a vagina. they're not A baby's not supposed to come out of it just because they're having sex. Who does that? Who does that? We got all this technology. <laughs> And allow your children to have access to it. But you can't prevent pregnancy? You got like 25 forms of birth control. And spare me. Please spare me. Well, you don't know what those chemicals do. You ain't know what the shot does, but you took it. So let's let's get past all of that. See, under racism and white supremacy, there are a lot of stuff that we can do, but black folks won't do it. I think we scared. I mean, really been traumatized. We just afraid. Won't read the books. Won't teach the young people. You know, don't do this, don't do that. And also, we talk about influence in music. Did y'all know that when I was coming up in the 80s, 90s, had the NWA, you had Uncle Luke, as nasty as they want to be, the top album, they got them banned. <laughs> we had, um, then uh, in, in, in the 90s, you had 3 6 Project Petal. Uh, of course, the Living Legends, A Ball and MJG. We had Player Fly, Gangsta Black, Scarface Al Capone, uh, Skinny Pimp. You had, uh, what's this other cat now? I can't remember. I, I'll come up with it later. Uh, DJ Squeaky, Spanish Fly, Oh Word. We had, we had. <laughs> We had everybody. Raider J. Hello. Club No Name. We had everybody. Memphis was booming. And they fought and cut up like that too. You know. Uh, Scarface and Ghetto Boys. All I have in this world. All I have in this world. That song, come on, man. Furniture started moving. But they fought. Yeah, they fought in school a little bit. And fought it. But everybody lived to talk about, man, you see how you whip that dude there. Man, I'm going to get them boys, man. They lived. There were no. Nothing shot up. People, there were no heavy drive-bys. If they were, they went to me. It must have been, I don't know. It must have been around Lamar Terry's area up there. Or Lamar Gardens or her business somewhere. One in the, in the neighborhood. Probably out there in Westwood. It might have been cutting up like that. But but it wasn't a thing like it is now. Because there's no masculinity in these boys. Not all. Y'all know it's not all. Educational system, you know, it could be subpar, but books are free. Memphis has a beautiful library on Poplar. It's been there for years. All kinds of books in that damn library. And they have what's called community libraries. Plenty of books. What you think you're not getting out of the school system, 
and your kids to attend public school, you can get in the library. And people love to talk about Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a hooligan in the beginning, went to jail, found Islam, and came out and took over the world with one book at a time. Became one of the best, the most fierce debaters and intellectuals our time has ever seen, has ever known, by reading. And this is what I'm talking about. See, I, if you want to know what we're not doing, how we're screwing up, go and look in the past and see what our people who had much less than what we have now. See how they made it. They weren't perfect. They weren't angels. But they didn't have what we have. We have so much access to economics, access to education. Literacy should not be so low. I'm sorry. Illiteracy should not be so high. There it is. It doesn't make any sense. And that's what we need to talk about. Stop all the goddamn prayers and prayer breakfasts. Stop all the marching in the street. If you're not going to get in the street with at least $300 million in funding for these neighborhoods to build it and employ the people who live there to help them build the neighborhoods. And also, let me tell you something how lame the black preachers and politicians are. They suck all kinds of butt. You know, and then, of course, they'll say, well, you know, we don't have the budget for it. We don't have the budget. But isn't it interesting when they're running for office, all of a sudden they can come up with $150,000 for that campaign? And everybody, Nancy, Nancy Gibson says, we have access and we don't take advantage of it. That's true. Mary Max says, Congressman Hakeem Jeffrey, Bishop Talbot, uh, Swan, Nina, what's that? Swan, Nina, Turner, Congressman Jamal Bowman, David Page. Shout out. Um, what was I about to say before I started reading those doggone comments? I was talking about, dang it, I just... See, that's why I try not to read the comments. It'll throw me off my, my what I'm talking about. But, uh, oh, yeah. See, you know how they can raise $100,000, $50,000, get donations from all over the place when they're running for a job, when they're trying to get a job that only pays $30,000 a year? See, the same way they can get our attention with flyers, mailers, and all our, and all our mailboxes when they're running for office, knock, knock, door to door. They go door to door. How come these same people can't muster up $150,000 per politician to go knock door to door and say, Hey, do you need counseling? These are the places that offer counseling. Hey, uh, if you're poor and live in these projects, it's not racism, it's you. If you're under the age of 50 and you're right here talking about you're poor, it's not racism, it's you. Nobody told you to have all these babies by five different dudes. It's you. But we'll help you. But we're not going to collar you anymore. Boom, boom, boom. So you say, my depots ain't going to help her anywhere do nothing. Well, you know, if you stop smoking blunts, pull your pants up, stop getting all these damn tattoos everywhere. And wearing this weird ass blonde, blonde ass, blonde weave and burgundy hair and all this weird stuff. You can get employed. How about you not dropping out of school in the 10th grade and hitting the streets? That helps. You know, knock on the door and tell them, see, people have to be told. Memphis is in a mindset crisis, the same mindset crisis for the past 20 years. That's the problem. Not the need of prayer. Money and people being told, you're the issue. Because, see, one thing, you, you, you may not have any money, but you do have control over self. Now, if you got a mental health problem, well, politicians, let's put together $50 million to make sure each zip code has a viable mental health outpatient facility where it can address these traumatic issues. Now, if you need my help, I'm a licensed, I'm an LMSW in the state of Tennessee. I work one of them or be the, the director of the program if you need me to. And we have a lot of competent LCSWs and PhDs, all kinds of folks in Memphis. And they still don't know what to do. I know we got Lakeside and a few other places around there, but Frazier and North Memphis, uh, 38108 and all those folks, they, 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 they need more mental health care there. And, and those nonprofits that are set up there in Memphis, 
Y'all need to really push, if you have one, a literacy program. Because too many people in Memphis and all these black sections of all these urban areas in all 50 states or as it relates to the largest cities, it's too many people, grown people, who don't know how to read and comprehend. Doesn't make any sense. But they're always saying, we need to bring jobs into Memphis. Cause, well, if they bring the job, they can't read the damn instructions. Because it's computerized. So the job market, the people, the employees aren't there because they can't read. Their minds are bad. Full of blunts. Full of rap. Yeah, I said it. But you know, everything's up for interpretation. We're going to have to do better. So y'all stop this. Let's pray. No, and pray for Memphis crap. This is not Paris. Memphis wasn't bombed. Nobody dropped a missile on Memphis. Yeah, Memphis was. A missile was dropped on Memphis. But it's a mental missile. Just blew the common sense and intelligence out of half the damn people there. That's what happened. And we got all those educators at Lemoyne on at University of Memphis, uh, Christian Brothers. We got some black folks that work at Rhodes. And y'all can't come up with a plan to address the nigger mentality in Memphis? That's the problem. Even got the mentality on the police force. Some hood ass dudes and dudettes. There's cops there. Because no one is demanding uh, better or raising the expectations of the elected officials and the law enforcement there. That's all. It's, it's not difficult. How y'all think these other the, the sub suburbs around Memphis functioning so well while using your tax dollars to keep their suburban lifestyles going? Those areas look good off of Memphis Black Memphis is tax dollars. And y'all got city councilmen, you got state representatives, you got county commissioners, and they act like they cannot access any money to, to begin the process of community development. They're handing you $10,000 here, $5,000 there. $15,000 there. No, we need $150 million, $300 million to do some real revitalization in these black neighborhoods. That's what needs to be done. And if the person that you're voting for next year cannot say, okay, I will, and sign a contract, I will put try to get with other council members and, and, and uh, county commissioners to put together a $250 million, $350 million economic package for your district or your zip code, don't vote for them. I already told y'all stop voting for these black gays and black Greeks and these white or Democrats, period. Because that's what's kept y'all neighborhoods looking like crap. And also the mindset, just like they can go to door, door to door to try to get you to take the vaccine, uh, the, the potion. It's like go door to door to try to get you to vote. Door to door to let you know I'm running for office. Just like they can do that, how come they can go door to door and pass out a 8 by 11 little newsletter saying, this is the reason why you're poor and stop doing it. And if you need mental health help, and then write down what no, put depression on the paper and say these are the symptoms of depression. Put uh, uh, ang general anxiety disorder on there, put and just pass it to the people. Make it a monthly deal. About three years, three to five years, you'll start seeing a difference because you have to make people feel no. Put people in charge of themselves. Empower them to take control of their own destiny. You say to them, "Why are you robbing family dollar?" That's on this in your neighborhood. Why are you robbing people? Why are you drop robbing your neighbor? If you think you broke around here, well, you think your neighbor next door on Shannon Street got more than you, fool? Everybody messed up. So why would you break in their house? Because they they took time to save their money to get that big screen. And I'm just I'm just throwing stuff out here that doesn't make sense. How you you broke and you poor. But you're going to go rob somebody who lives your same on your same street, in your same neighborhood, your same zip code. If they live where you live, they messed up too. Do y'all understand how this works? Prayer's not going to help this. Getting off your ass is going to help this. 
letting people know you're out of line. And we need real politicians who are not afraid to not who are not afraid to not get reelected to use their huge platforms to tell Black Memphis cut it out, cut it out. And if you're gonna honor Young Dolph, honor him, what it, the good works that he was doing, you continue it. Go to school, help out your neighbor, mentor the young kids, turn off the gang life. Try to stop the thotting and the prostituting and the stripping. Go to school. Learn to read. Seek therapy for your trauma. So those are some of the good works he was leading up to, the things he was doing, and I'm sure he eventually would have got to. So let's concentrate on that, all right? And I think I want to see if I, 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 I had a little list of things I want to talk about. I think I addressed everything, but if I didn't, I'll do another live and I'll catch up on it. But uh. You know what, y'all be cool. I'm not going to hold y'all. Again, I wrote a book. It's uh, 50 pages. For those who have not uh, read it before, it's called The Greatest Pain I Ever Felt. A conversation with an absent biological father who never wanted to be found. And basically the book is about me accidentally finding about who my actual biological father is at age 22. He never really wanted to meet and anything, but I, but it was about me and not about him, so... Uh, at age 39, on December 25th, 4.30 p.m., I just got in, my, got in my car and I took my brother with me. We just looked up some addresses. One of them happened to be his. The first one, as a matter of fact, on, on the list of five. And uh, knocked on the door. He came to the door like, wow, damn. You know, because I already knew he sounded like me on the phone. But when I saw and saw where this, where this came from, I'm like, damn. I was just in shock. So I told my brother, uh, uh, no, he said, hey. My brother said, hey, what's up? My name is Eric. He said, hey, Eric. And I said, um, and I said I'm Rico. Oh, hey, Rico. Yeah, just like that. Then he asked me, so I have to ask you, how did you find me? I told him, map question, no Google Maps. And he so it said to me, to my face, standing right there, uh, I have to give you an A for effort because I've worked aggressively over the years to prevent you from ever finding me. And so if you'd like to check it out, hit your boy up on the PayPal, I'm um, sorry, the Cash App, as well as PayPal, Rico the Opinionist, dollar sign Rico the Opinionist, is R-I-C-O-T-H-E-O-P-I-N-I-O-N-I-S-T. Thank y'all so much. Hey, don't stay up too late. I'm going to hit the Zeke wheel. Mary Max, call me good when I go home. Talk to y'all later. Peace. <laughs>